Cheers and welcome to Americans Learn. My name is Lauren and we, I'm dying still. <coughs> so sorry about that. It will continue to happen. So maybe take a drink every time I cough because someone's got to get drunk. It's not going to be me. But today I'm watching Fat Electrician. Once again, I'm going to be watching Angry Old Veteran versus 700 Redcoats. Samuel Whitemore. Whitmore? Not sure. I'll find out how badly I said that in just a few moments. I'm excited. I like the Fat Electrician videos. I'm excited to be on the cut. This is a new one. So I'm looking forward to learning. I hope you are as well. And now let us begin. Official state hero of Massachusetts. Today we're talking about Samuel Whitmore, quite possibly Whitmore. America's first anti-hero and the most gangster old man of all time. But first okay. I want to sponsor because this video is brought to you by Operation Good Boy. They make all kinds of dog related products from supplements to treats to toys Puppy. to dog poop picker upper bags. And Mushu absolutely loves the Made in America treats ready to eat. He named his dog, his dog's name is Mushu. I guess we know what his favorite Disney movie is. Do you roll over? Roll over. Nope. <laughs> roll over. <laughs> Come on. You got it. No, do the whole thing. You got to do the whole thing, dude. Roll over. Roll over. Roll over. You're making me look bad on camera. Roll over. <laughs> Fine. Good enough. <laughs> Cl yeah, close enough. Good job. So yeah, check them out at OperationGoodBoy.com. Use the code QUACK15 for 15% off. Let's get back to the video. All right, Samuel Whitmore. We don't know much, but here's what we do know. He was born in Charlestown, Massachusetts in 1696. From there, he goes dark. We don't hear from him until 1721 when he gets wow. married to his wife, Elizabeth Spring. Then he goes dark again. There's nothing of him in the historical record until 1744. At the age of 48 years old, he would All fight right. in King George's War. And during cool. So every like 20 or so years, he just shows his ugly head i see in that war he held the rank of captain leading an entire platoon of dragoons during the siege of loisburg if you don't know dragoon is just a fancy word for cavalry so think of like okay. malfoy's dad from the patriot same thing so that's cool okay whatever, but here's the important part that nobody else ever brings up like i said he's a captain which is a way bigger deal than most people make it out to be and here's why there's really only two ways that you can become an officer in the british military at this point in time way number one you were born into a wealthy british aristocratic family and daddy's got a lot of money that's like 95 percent of the british officers at this point in time or way number two and way way less likely you are a complete badass doing gangster shit on the regular and they absolutely need you to lead some men given the fact that samuel's just some random colonial that was born in massachusetts it kind of narrows down which category he fell into so okay. he and his men help lay siege to fort lewisburg that goes well they take over the fort from there the war is over so he heads back home to what is now arlington massachusetts from there he goes back to doing seemingly the only other thing he's good at because i'm not kidding you this guy does two things his entire life he plows stuff and he fights wars. When he's not fighting wars, he's back at home plowing his fields and plowing his wife because this dude has 10 kids. I am not kidding you. There was only two All things right. on the historical. I mean, honestly, not going to lie. 10 kids is seems like a lot, but up until very recently, it wasn't really that. It was like that was all kind of. I feel like it was kind of par for the course. Yeah, like my grandfather on my mom's side. He had, he was one of 10 that survived childhood. Um, there was 12 altogether, but like 10 that survived childhood. And again, he lived, he was a farmer. Um, like even my, even my dad, like one of six or something, like six or seven. How many of them are there? Anyway, like I'm just saying, like it's, it doesn't seem that weird to have that many kids, especially back. I mean, if they all survived, that's awesome. I wonder, like, I do wonder how many of his kids didn't survive though, because there had to have been a few record that even proved that this man existed for the next 10 years. One is the Again, sheer amount of birth certificates going, where he is listed as the father. Again, going dark. I thought he was going to say that he's good at fighting wars and going dark because he does seem to just sort of disappear every, every, 10 years and then he shows up every 10 years then he's gone for the next several father i mean the mother is always his wife he's not cheating on his wife it's just they're having a bunch of kids and second and my most favorite detail of this entire story when he came back from war he had a very very decorative ornate 
almost gaudy French officer's sword covered in gold and rhinestones and jewels and all kinds of shit. And it became his prized possession that he would show off to all of his buddies in town. And when they would ask him where on earth he got that, the only thing he would say is, and I quote, <coughs> the previous owner died suddenly. Fucking, I acquired it. All right, so fast forward 10 years. It's always, it's always 10. Like he, well, it was, it was, 20 years twice and now it's 10 years so it's like every every decade or so he shows back up it is now 1754 and attila the whitmore over here is approximately 58 years old and <coughs> an indian war breaks out now does sam have to go fight this war absolutely not he is a 58 year old man in the 1700s when the life expectancy is 60 he should be killing over any minute now but he also has 10 kids, so he's literally like, um, mm -hmm. honey, I gotta go beat up the French again. Okay, bye. Oh, fun. If you I don't know the French and Indian that. Wars, basically. I didn't even notice that gun back there. That's fantastic. That's good set design. Like, it's good set design. I like, didn't even notice it. The Kingdom of France versus the British Empire, and both sides are backed by different Native American tribes. This is supposedly the war that Mel Gibson's character fought in in The Patriot, and presumably where he got his cool tomahawk from. Now, I know what you're thinking. Did Sam Whitmore get a cool tomahawk too? No, no he didn't. But what he did get was two matching dueling pistols that were super cool. And you're never going to believe this, but the previous owner died suddenly. Okay, look, it's not stealing if they don't exist anymore. That's just the rules, I guess. So Sam- Exactly, that's how that works. If the previous owner dies suddenly and you happen to be there, I mean, you don't want the stuff to go to waste. That, like, wastefulness is next to godlessness is surely a quote from somewhere. Sam and his men beat up on the French yet again. He acquires some fancy dueling pistols and then he heads back home. Okay, fast forward again. <laughs> Another time, geez, like again, every decade. It is now 1763 and Sam Whitmore is 67 years old and the Pontiac Rebellion breaks out. Surely he's going to sit this one out, right? Absolutely not. He grabs his French sword, he grabs his double dueling pistols, his musket, and he heads off to war yet again. So he goes, he fights in that war for a little bit, comes back home, at which point he decides that he's going to get involved in politics. So somewhere along the line, he starts rolling around in the political circles. He finds himself at a fancy dinner party, and there's this guy there that's running for House of Representatives, and his name is John Vassal, and he represents everything that Sam hates. Sam is a small town farmer that's just trying to plant his crops and bang his wife, and this guy is like the big powerful merchant out of Boston, the big city, running the ports, making all this money. He wants to get into office to make make laws more beneficial to him so he can be rich and Sam is just trying to get by. So at this dinner party, Sam, who's not scared of anybody, informs him, hey, by the way, you're no better suited for office than the horse I rode in on. By the way, my horse's name is Nero. He's parked out front and he's not worth five pounds, which I'm not an expert in translating old timey colonial speak, but it sounds like he's saying you're not worth a horse's ass. Go fuck yourself. At which point, John Vassal gets very upset and decides that he is going to sue Sam for public defamation for the price of 1,000 pounds, which is a shit ton of money back then. So I mean, yeah, also he wasn't defamed. Like, somebody called, said, hey, you're not worth shit, and he's like, my honor is at stake. Like, that's not defamation. It doesn't have to be in, like, a public sphere. Like, like very, okay, whatever. People had weak weak skins back in the day. I mean, a lot of people still do, to be fair, but. So the entire town finds out about this lawsuit and they all show up to court to actually watch the trial because Sam represents that grizzled <coughs> old man that's just saying what's on everybody's mind, but nobody else has the balls to say. And he goes in and basically turns this entire trial into the roast of John Vassal, ends up winning, Sam doesn't get sued, at which point he slaps him with a counter lawsuit on the spot and ends up counter suing him for $200 and wins. So that kind of launches Sam's political career. Fast forward again. Good for him. It is now 1765 and the British Empire has been fighting France for quite a while and it's getting expensive. They need to make more money and the best thing they can come up with is the Stamp Act. Basically, they're going to charge the colonials a tax 
on every single printed piece of paper that they come up with. This is like the modern day equivalent of if every time you made a phone call, sent a text, or visited a website, you had to pay a tax for it. And people are absolutely outraged, and Sam is infuriated. I mean, from his point of view, he's been fighting the French for the British Empire, and now he's gonna have to pay an extra tax just for doing it? He is so mad that he ends up becoming a hardcore revolutionary. But he's also like a 70-year-old okay. man, so he's mostly just serving on committees being like, hey, maybe America should be its own country, we shouldn't pay so much in taxes, yada, yada, yada. Fast forward again. It is now 1773, Samuel Whitmore is a 75 year old man and the British government has just rolled out their new and improved strategy for making even more money the Tea Act. Yeah, they're going to start taxing the importation of tea, which will go down in history as one of the greatest ideas of all time. Now, at this yeah. point, Sam is serving on a committee Brilliant. representing his hometown of Cambridge, which would later become known as Arlington. And that committee sends a response to the British government in regards to the Tea Act that basically says, fine, if you're going to charge us more money, we're just not going to buy your tea because, and I quote, if we fail to assert our rights, we will dwindle into supineness. Now, like I said earlier, not an expert in translating old time colonial talk, but it sounds like Sam and his committee just told the British government that we're not going to buy your metric leaf water because we're not going to let you guys fuck us. That's why. At this point, pretty much everybody in America is pissed off. They start smuggling tea to avoid taxes. The Boston Tea Party happens December 1773. From there, people just start stockpiling guns and gunpowder and supplies, getting ready for war if one should break out. Now, fast forward April 1775, General Thomas Gage is appointed the military governor of Massachusetts, and he will be residing in Boston, which is has been turned into a British military stronghold. At that point, General Gage decides, hey, you know what? I'm gonna get proactive. I'm gonna stomp out this whole rebellion talk right here and right now. I'm gonna take 700 men, an entire regiment, and I'm gonna march them out to Lexington and Concord. While they're in mm. Lexington, they're gonna arrest those stupid, annoying revolutionaries, John Hancock and Samuel Adams, and then they're gonna continue marching to Concord where they're gonna burn down all the stocked up military supplies. So the British military uh -oh. starts making preparations for a huge movement, at which point revolutionary spies find out and they decide to let everybody know. And when I say they decide to let everybody know, I mean a silversmith from Boston by the name of Paul Revere is gonna take off at midnight, ride through the entire countryside going house to house telling everybody that the british are coming and it was him and a couple it wasn't just him i like I, like that is one thing that i learned fairly recently that there were more than just paul paul revere was not the only one that did this there were a couple people who were going to make this ride. Guess whose house is between Boston and Lexington? Sam motherfucking Whitmore, that's who. I'm not shitting you. It is like 99% sure that Paul Revere showed up at 78-year-old Samuel Whitmore's house sometime in the middle of the night and was like, hey, just letting you know, the British are coming. At which point he's like, Get off my lawn. Then presumably Paul Revere is like, okay, whatever, I gotta go warn everybody else, and Samuel goes back to bed. That morning, April 19th, 1775, the British are marching and they're almost to Lexington, and they are cut off by 77 Minutemen, led by a man by the name of John Parker. John Parker orders the Minutemen to, quote, stand your ground, don't fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have war, let it begin here. So the British roll up with Ooh, 700 wow. professional soldiers. Like, I didn't, like... I was like, what, 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 like, what, the green, right? Like, the shot heard around the world. I thought that was... Until these 77 Minutemen, literally farmers that just picked up whatever guns they had around and told them, disperse you rebel scum. At which point, the Minutemen are like, nah, we're good. We're going to stay right here, and so are you. And that's exactly what happens. They just stand there staring at each other from across this field with the British officer not knowing what to do because he has to get to Concord to get rid of these supplies because those were his orders, but he also doesn't want to open fire on these guys because that will mean the start of the Revolutionary War. So they just stood there, seemingly forever, in formation, ready to throw down, waiting for the other guy to make the first move. And suddenly, from the American side, a gun goes off. There it is. There's the shot heard around the world. No, I thought no one knows who did it. Nobody knows who fired. Nobody okay, knows. Yeah. Nobody knows who fired. Okay. I think I thought I heard like the assumption was that like it might have been an accident. But Why? But this was the shot heard around the world that would start the American Revolution. And for all we know, it could have. And all I can think of every time I hear about this is like I can only think about the freaking America rocks song. It was like, was the shot heard around the world was the start of the revolution like that. Did anybody else listen to Schoolhouse Rock? <laughs> like, that song gets stuck in my head a stupid amount of time. Like, 
I haven't watched that movie since sixth grade, but like that song gets stuck in my head a lot. Could have been some old farmer that just dropped his gun. From there, all hell breaks loose. Both sides fire on each other. Eight American Minutemen are killed and the British advance <coughs> towards Concord. The surviving Minutemen take off to go tell everybody that the Revolutionary War has officially begun as the British spend the next four hours searching through Concord, gathering all the military supplies and lighting them on fire. Everybody in the surrounding area sees all the smoke from the burning supplies and they think that the British military is burning down the entire town of Concord. Because of that, 2,000 Minutemen show up to fight back, at which point wow. the British are like oh shit and they start retreating they run across the bridge and start ripping the planks off of it as they go at which point the 2000 minute men and 700 british soldiers fire upon one another from either side of this bridge as the british continue to retreat the british now have to march 18 miles back to their military stronghold in boston in their stupid high-vis red coats and every <laughs> single american with a gun between there and boston is taking pop shots at them from the wood line during this retreat 26 red coats go missing 175 are wounded and 73 are killed and three of them at least are from Samuel Whitmore. So we cut back to Samuel Whitmore. He's 78 years old, chilling at home, presumably plowing something. What? We don't really know. And he just hears gunfire going off in the background and it's getting closer and closer. And then he remembers, oh, that fucking kid woke me up last night in midnight, told me the British were coming. Maybe that's what's going on. So he goes, he grabs his fancy French officer sword, both of his dueling pistols and his musket, and he goes out to the main road that the British would be marching past. And he's going to stand by the stone wall next to the main road and just wait for the fight to come to him like the complete badass that he is. At this point, all the younger men at men are running up to check on this old man like, hey... What, what are you doing? You shouldn't be out here. And if you are going to try to do this kind of stuff, at least go out in the wood line or in like a second story window to hide yourself like the rest of us so you don't get yourself killed. To which Samuel Whitmore responds, and I quote, if I can only be the instrument for killing one of my country's foes, I shall die in peace. Which I think we can all agree is gangster <laughs> as fuck. At this point, yeah, this man is. is literally the living embodiment of old man's strength. He's just that old, grizzled, veteran Viking that's got one more fight left in him and wants to die in battle so he can go to Valhalla. So he stays there, he loads his musket, he loads his pistols, and he waits. And he waits, and finally the British come marching right down the road, dead at him. As they get close, he crouches down behind the stone wall with his musket and waits until they get to point blank range, and that's when he pops up over the wall, aims his gun, I said get off my lawn now, and fires, immediately killing one red coat on the spot, drawing both of his pistols, killing two more red coats drawing his sword and charging what? over 500 soldiers on his own. He is then immediately shot in the face. He falls yeah. to the ground and is somehow still alive, so he reaches to grab one of his guns and start reloading it, at which point the British run up and stab him with bayonets somewhere between six and 13 times. Apparently after the first five, they all kind of blend together. He is then clubbed in the head with the butt of a rifle and left for dead as his body lays there mangled and lifeless as the British continue to march through the town on their way to Boston. Is this like, wait, no, does he crawl back home? Like, is that what he does? Did he crawl back? Is he the guy that crawled back home and he died there, I think? Four hours later, the townspeople notice that his corpse starts moving. So they pick Samuel up, they get him over to the doctor, they alert the family, the okay. family shows up to the doctor, at which point the local town doctor, Nathaniel Tufts, is like, the dude is 78 years old. He wasn't prepared to handle a fall down the stairs, let alone getting stabbed 13 times and shot in the head. Okay, like there's no way this old man's gonna make it. But like I said, his family members start showing up and guess how many direct descendants Samuel Whitmore has at this point in time after all that plowing? Go ahead, give it a guess. Say it in your head. 60. Okay, you got your number? 65. Okay, he's got 185 living descendants. Okay, he's got five generations beneath him. He's Oh my God. Okay, so let's just like think about that. So he's 78, whatever. He has 10 kids, right? We know that he had 10, 10 kids or so. If all, well, I mean, okay. So if all 10 of his kids had 10 kids, that's 100. And then if all 10 of those kids had a couple of kids, 
Because he's 78 if he started hat popping those kids out at 20, right? Like, that gives him time. Like, like his grandchildren could, he could have, he could be a great grandpa. So if, like, his kids, all 10 of his kids had 10 kids, that's 110 that we're at right now. So now we just have to find 75 more people. So if all 10 of those kids had a bunch of kids. Okay, I can see how we get 100, 185 living descendants, though. That's nuts. He's got kids, grandkids, great grandkids, great grandkids squared, and great grandkids cubed. 185 people showing up to the doctor like, hey, save grandpa. At this point, poor Dr. Tufts is like, I, dude's gonna <laughs> die, but I'm not about to tell 180 grandkids that, so I'll try my best. So he does what he can, he bandages him up and sends him home with his family, and they take care of him for the remainder of his days. And when I say the remainder of his days, what I mean is, let me check my notes real quick. Uh, I mean that he passed on February 3rd, 1793. This motherfucker lived for 18 more years and passed away at the age of 96. And to commemorate Samuel Whitmore, there's actually a monument where he made his last stand. Huh. You said that he was 78 during his last stand and 96 when he died, and that clearly says that he was 98 when he died and 80 during his last stand. Why are you so dumb? Huh. Okay, look, I understand your point, and I also can kind of sort of read, and I realize the irony because this is literally written in stone, and I'm telling you that it's wrong, but it is wrong. That is the only source that says that he was 98 when he died and 80 during his last stand. Every other source says that he was 78, and 96. This has been proven to be false multiple times, but they don't want to change it because the monument's already so old. So Fair. yes, I'm sticking with what I said. But the most important part of this picture is to actually zoom in on the house in the background. That's Samuel Whitmore's original house where he lived his entire life. And it's still around today as a historical site in Arlington, Massachusetts. And that monument is in the front yard. So if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, what I'm trying to tell you is in conclusion, this has been the story of America's first and oldest gangster, a 78 year old grizzled veteran that woke up on the first day of the American Revolutionary War and decided to casually go three and zero while telling the entire British empire to get off his lawn. Thank you for watching. Best way to support wow. the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang, out. Okay. So I apparently had not heard of him. There was, oh wait, hold up, pause, stop. There's more. I didn't realize there was more. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's more. I'm gonna have to go back in. We're going back in. I've never been more excited for a future T-shirt design. I can see it now. America's original gangster. Get off my lawn. Samuel Whitmore with two cross dueling pistols and a sword. It's gonna be fantastic. Okay, now it's over. All right. Wow. Okay, so like there's there's like some American Revolutionary War heroes or people that I'd heard of, but like <coughs> I thought I I thought I'd heard of him. I had not. I every so often like I'll get excited cuz I'm like, "Wait a minute. I remember like a vague story that I used to know back when I was 10." And then it turns out I I still have it. I still don't know what that one was. It's okay. It's fine. I'll be all right. Um, sorry again about coughing. I know that I, it's been, it's been a long, long freaking month and I blame at least partly the weather, um, jumping back and forth continually between, um, cold and hot and like, it's just been a lot. Um, uh, but Hey, look, I got my oh, no, other one. I got my, my shots today. <laughs> No, I got my flu and COVID shots today. So that's where I'm at with that. Um, hopefully I will continue to get better. I am, I am feeling better than I was a few days ago. I just am still coughing a lot. <coughs> um, so again, thank you all for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed this video. I certainly did. Um, and uh, don't forget to pick up our shot glasses in the uh, merch store below. It is linked there. Um, and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you all in the next video.